Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 572, being recorded on January 22nd, 2020. I'm Sebastian Peak. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm the last guy. I'm Josh Walrath. What do you get? It used to be like Alan Malventano was there, and then Jeremy yeah. was last, and yeah. it was... <sighs> Which isn't fair, because Jeremy... Was... Look, if it went by seniority, Jeremy would have been first. He should have been. been Ryan, then Jeremy, then Josh. Alan was after Josh, right? He was oh, yeah. after me. Yeah. Yeah. Because you started in what, like 09, 08? 2000, end of 2008. Okay. I signed over my soul to ride Shroud. Look where it got me. Well, I was he place. needed one. Yeah. And then Ken. Also a ginger. I mean, Ken, uh, kind of a strawberry blonde, perhaps. No, he, he, was, he was definitely, his complexion was was pale ginger. In fact, I, I think Ryan was darker than Ken. Well, yeah. Some days. Somehow. But I just, Ryan's you know, positively, little... positively swarthy standing next to Ken. <laughs> As compared to Ken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor Ken. Even I didn't look as pale next to Ken. And Ken, you know, yeah. I, you're probably not watching, but just in case this gets to you somehow. It probably uh, will. You know, I'm, I'm not sorry. Um, some interesting news in the last week or so, and and I could go through the whole like preamble that we we sometimes do about like how to find us, pcper.com on the internet. If you should totally the do the Patreon because podcast. I like to get oh, yeah. paid every month. Yeah. I love getting Patreon. paid every month. We do have a Patreon. You can find it patreoncom pcper. Oh please, Lord! All that good stuff. No, we have a mailing Patreon. list. We have a mailing list. I don't know if the email went out. I think it may have gone out. Yeah, I think someone said they did. Did for some reason it's been going into my promotions folder now, by default. So I don't get the alert for it. But oh, here it is. Eight thirty-seven p.m. It went out. So around ten o'clock Eastern on generally Wednesdays. Sometimes we do it on Thursday. Just whatever works out for us. This little group of people working remotely together. As you can see, if you're watching the video, we're all in these little boxes because. You know, Josh is in Wyoming. I'm in Michigan. And why know, do we keep letting people put Canada? us in a box? It's that would have to do with the yeah. restraining orders. Mm. It, this is what Interstate Josh, remember, commerce. we talked about this we, in yeah. one of our uh, we don't have to go behind the scenes too much. But one of our um, remote uh, group therapy sessions, they talked about the fact that the distance kind of gives us. Um, it helps us define our boundaries, literally. Like we have like physical um, boundaries to. Uh, Mine is like it, the state a, of Nebraska. Because I, I, I will admit that I did drive cross country to Montana a few years ago, but Josh would not let me into I, his I house. I don't live so. in Montana. Well, I mean, I, I passed through Wyoming on the way. Oh, that's, that's I 90 for you. I think I went through Wyoming. There's a lot of mountains. I remember a lot of mountains and a snowstorm. Uh, should not have been. Dri don't ever drive across the country in winter. Is what I learned in a Toyota Prius. Unless you're going uh, south. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, major news reviews. The story basically uh, was the, the uh, Radeon uh, RX 5600 XT. And if you are not familiar with it, announced just recently at CES, and it's already here. This is the slightly cut down version of an RX 5700, the non XT. So it has the same 2304 streaming processor count. And actually, there were quite a few more differences when it was announced. Uh, this was this is a weird launch. This is uh, it was one of those things where I had a feeling something was going to go down. Because at CES, EVGA, who's closely partnered with NVIDIA, they don't sell AMD graphics cards, EVGA announces a $279 RTX 2060. Now, that was a temporary price cut. The KO. The, that's right. The I did not realize this. Do you remember the old KO cards? Apparently, they used KO back in the 2000 aughts. No, I, I uh, no, no. So there was apparently a KO series back in the day, like just like they have their FTW series and 
and they had they used to have like GTS and GTX NVIDIA that was NVIDIA's like branding for things. But uh EVGA apparently at one point had a KO card, I think in the 9000 series. And they've brought it back. Although what was funny is in their marketing, I think we talked about this last week, they they had used KO as knockout and they talked about the fact that this new card was going to knock out the competition. They didn't name the competition, but it was obvious $279 price point. They are gunning for the 20, it's 5600 XT, which was announced by AMD at that price point. Now, completely forgetting about uh, the fact that availability of a $299 or you know even $279 with this $20 instant rebate, RTX 2060 is non-existent right now with the cheapest available cards being probably like 310, 320. Uh, still, a- AMD needed to do something because here's this announced product stealing their thunder saying, oh, by the way, RTX 2060, which is uh, going to be a lot faster than a GTX 1660 Ti, which is the product that AMD compared their new 5600 XT to in every slide. Uh, AMD, I expected a price drop. I don't know. Did you guys think when you, you heard about the cheaper RTX 2060 that they would have to drop the price before launch that AMD would? They should, or they should have, as one way of giving you some bit of sleep. I, I was thinking $20. Like if it came out at, at $259, because the last product launch, like the RTX, not the last one, that was the 5500 XT, but the... The 5700 series, it was announced at one price. It came out at a lower price. They acted like they had baited NVIDIA into pricing the super cards the way that they did, and then they undercut them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the whole jet baited thing, which is apparently uh jensen baited i guess i never fully understood what the Something, jeb was yeah. was it a jeb bush no, reference it, no yeah. no it's because because you know, what, what jeb is you gotta have you know like that that's that's the whole jeb thing with the map of the country behind him but mm-hmm. you know enough of memes uh so anyway they didn't they didn't lower the price so what they did was very late in the game just a few days before launch, if you were lucky and if you were unlucky and your partner card came from one of the companies that was sending out these BIOS updates like a day or two before the launch, thus invalidating all of your testing up to that point, they came out with a a BIOS update for all of the partner uh, cards or to raise the specs significantly. We're talking about a 200-ish megahertz clock speed jump and we're talking about a, I, I initially the memory uh, speed, the total memory uh, data rate was uh, 12 gigabit per second. And we're thinking, okay, this is a cost saving measure because the other cards are all 14. Well, no, apparently it was just artificial segmentation. So this firmware update takes the memory from 12 up to 14 gigabit per second. So it gives you a huge increase in memory bandwidth from 288 gigabytes per second up to 336. So now it's far more competitive with NVIDIA RTX cards. It it comes closer to the bandwidth of the 5700 series. They're bridging the gap. This Instead of coming out with a 5650 or something down the road, this is essentially that. This is a jump to the halfway point between what they announced at CES and a 5700. And it's pretty remarkable that you get just a flat 10% jump in performance across the board from a firmware update. So this is, they had mentioned to reviewers kind of like, hey, this is going to have quite a bit of overclocking headroom. And I'm thinking, right, because it's a Navi 10 GPU and you've just clocked it down. And I thought we'd at least be able to clock it up, you know, enough to get closer to a 5700 but the memory was going to hold it back because these are memory bandwidth constrained to some extent and then you know this this is greater than i ever thought like i didn't think i was going to have this much overclocking headroom let alone a bios update and then potentially even more for uh overclocking headroom but i'm guessing they're pushing this pretty far with with the new specs uh, which i mean we're talking about a boost clock that goes from 1560 up to 1750 and the game clock is now at 1,615 megahertz, I think is what it was. So the, the gr- just drastically different specs. Uh, yeah, 1,615 for the game clock. 
Uh, I might have the base clock wrong on our chart. I think my sample was 1410. It might have been 1420. I'll double check that. But the same number of texture units and ROPs as is 5700. The big difference is that when they cut down the memory from eight to six gigabytes of GDDR6, that you lost, uh, like the memory interface went from 256 to 192. And this is all similar to what we see on the NVIDIA side of things, but very different uh, with that 14 gigabit data rate versus 12, what it would have been with 12. And, it, and interestingly, they raised the TDP well, kind of obviously from 150 up to 160. In fact, I think uh, depending on the, the BIOS setting you have, and our card has two BIOS positions, we have the Sapphire Pulse, it goes from 135 all the way up to 160 watt total graphics power. And the the launch price, 279, our sample is 289, slightly higher uh, with our particular card. So the Sapphire Pulse, this card is built just like their 5700 series cards has the same uh, dual x cooler design so more than capable it's a two pretty fat heat pipes more than capable of handling the extra power and heat i think it's a pretty valid to you know if, to consider that some of the board partners probably had cards that had kind of lighter coolers maybe something closer to what we saw with 5500 uh, xt cards and now they're being asked to, hey, bump up your clock speeds considerably, bump up the TDP. Uh, do you, either of you think that's going to be an issue with any of these cards when they were designed, everything was out the door, literally shipped at one TDP and, uh, you know, a defined like clock and boost speeds and then gets bumped up literally at launch? Is, all these is there a reference these- model? No. Nope. No. Okay. Partner no, it's probably not a problem because uh, usually okay. the partners, they had do some branding and increase the t- 10 watt TDP increase is not huge when you consider okay. the size of these coolers, um, the fan profiles that you can adjust in BIOS, all that stuff. It's It's not, they're overbuilt usually anyway. Uh, unlike that, uh, yeah. what the, that new 299 2060 oh yeah the they, ko that's like bare bones no 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 not the yeah. ko but it was the uh it was the it's a oh new the design. strix the one the, the strix no no you, no like, i think it was super actually overbuilt strix you reviewed no okay. and, but it was like you yeah. know a four phase power array lesser cooling all this other stuff that to get it back down to do under 300 bucks um, yeah and it's not ko much what they were something else that, that i saw yeah, I was thinking I'm KO because wrong. it. The, I don't have a KO, but it looks exactly like the cooler uh, from the do. EVGA sixteen fifty that I got for review. Yeah. Like it's it's that really compact dual fan, yeah. uh, very lightweight kind of heat sink. Anyway, uh, I I tested uh, just to have a reference. I tested Far Cry Five with both the original BIOS and the update, the the primary charts and the review on the site have just the new firmware. Because, you know, this is how the card is going to perform either out of the box. And most of the Sapphire cards, apparently, because they got it a little bit sooner, they were the, the company that AMD was partnering with. The last two launches, I've received Sapphire cards directly from AMD. Uh, so they got it a little bit sooner. Most of the Sapphire Pulse cards out there already have this new firmware. So if you buy one of these, double check before you flash it needlessly. But uh, I had to flash mine because I got it a couple days before this all happened. And it was interesting. I mean, the, the results with the current BIOS, like the new BIOS, have it, like in Far Cry 5, it's uh, ahead of not only a 1660 Ti as we expected with the old firmware, But it's now ahead of an RTX 2060 and a GTX 1080. And it's not far behind a 2060 Super. So we're talking like two and a half frames per second on average, at least in Far Cry 5, at high, very high settings. We're talking 1440 Ultra, which is what I have been using for these sort of upper mid-range cards to just eliminate eliminate CPU as a bottleneck. Uh, I was somewhat time constrained because of the BIOS update. So I did not end up doing all new 1080 ultra or 1080 high testing. So I'll have to be 
later on. But Metro Exodus, a uh, very demanding DirectX 12 game. Uh, it's going to have much lower frame rates in the, with these cards at, at 1440 Ultra, but we're still talking 50 frames per second, very playable with this 5600 XT, which is better, again, than a GTX 1080 by about a frame and a half per second, and it's better than a RTX 2060 by about five frames per second. And of course, it's a lot faster than a 1660 Ti. If you go into like the very NVIDIA... Um, I would don't say advantage, but like GameWorks games like Final Fantasy 14 Shadowbringers at its higher settings, it uses GameWorks features. That's, you know, NVIDIA is typically on top there. I just threw that in there as an example because Far Cry 5 is very AMD friendly. A couple of the games are. And the other side of things, well, yeah, now the 2600 can look good on a chart because now it's about six frames per second faster than the 5600 XT. So it's it it's one of those things where you can you can trade back and forth between the RTX 2060 and this new 5600 XT if you're selective about what game titles you choose and what settings you choose. But overall, this 5600 XT I found to be a faster card than an RTX 2060 by just a little bit and kind of a neutral players this world of tanks on core benchmark i've been using for the last year older direct x11 title and usually you get very high frame rates we're talking 97 frames per second versus 97 and a half frames per second so between the rtx 2060 and the 5600 xt so uh basically tied at that point so it they they did it i mean this this firmware update brought them up to trading blows with an RTX 2060 at 279. And yeah, our card was a little bit more at 289, but I think that's just the cooler. I don't think this is clocked any higher than we're going to see other head and board partners for even the $279 versions of the cards. Um, power consumption. Here's another interesting stat. Power consumption pretty much even with an RTX 2060. So they both they both pulled 235 total system draw from the wall with the same test platform. So they've they've kind of got that dialed in. They we know exactly who their target is here. And just to yeah, give you an idea what, what the 12 bio... nanometer versus 7 nanometer stuff. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, Nvidia, we all know Nvidia has very efficient architecture even though they're on a that bigger process node. Yeah. So yeah, that's didn't really think about that. That's impressive that NVIDIA, even at 12 nanometers, is pulling the same for the same performance. It's like the old Athlon 64 against Pentium 4. <laughs> it's nice to see AMD dragging that power consumption down. Even yeah, if we could. as compared to their previous stuff, which was pretty yeah. toasty. As someone who's never done Pentium 4 versus Athlon XP benchmarking, Josh, I'm assuming mm-hmm. the Pentium 4 drew a lot more power. Especially that? Prescott. Oh, yeah. And Prescott, Prescott came out. Yes. Yeah, the press hot. Where people but, had set motherboards on uh on like uh styrofoam and it melted yeah. that stuff. It was bad, 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 bad news. I mean, yeah, it was bad news. But in a brilliant know, move because considering how I never had so much better time to do anything. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, here's awesome. the thing. <laughs> Tulatin was a great chip. Okay, yeah, the older one. Or the yeah. sorry, the more mature one. But well, the more mature. When that first came out. Yeah. What was the later one? Was that Copper Mine? Copper Mine was the first. Uh, not to get yeah. too far off track, but Copper Mine was the first of the L2 was integrated on there. The Pentium okay. Three was originally Klamath that had yeah, the that uh, right. SSE yeah. extensions, and it was the big SSE versus 3D now, and it was Klamath Copper Mine then. Tulatin was uh, a 180 nanometer Pentium 3 that could clock up there and was really efficient, but they didn't want to push that because they had Pentium 4, which was the future. Yes. And then they could start pointing the IPCs again. Yeah, I can remember these these names, but I can't remember what my kids are called. It's awful. Hey, kid. I was going to say that I had... I recently, well, not recently, it's been a few months, but I bought a like brand new inbox Pentium 4 and an Athlon XP, and I thought, I'll do this story where I revisit the two and 
benchmark them like because I'd never benchmarked them back in the day. I had an Athlon XP system. I didn't have a Pentium Four system, but yeah, that's they're still brand new in the box. Um, Northwood, Northwood next was the best mm, Pentium Four. That's what I have. It's a f- yeah, anyway. original. It's not a yeah. North was wait was Northwood started with four seventy eight. It was out on four twenty three. Was Northwood originally 423 with the RD RAM, or was that a new architecture? No, I think that was the previous which was Northwood yeah. was 478. Yeah. Okay. I do not remember the name of the 423. And then Prescott. Okay, so next story kind of ties in with this. The the day one VBIOS updates thing, which is next on our list. But quickly, comparing the two, the old BIOS as ship, the card that I received, I just threw it into the test system, quickly ran a couple of tests. Far Cry 5. On the old BIOS, average 75.5 frames per second. On the new BIOS, it's 84. Big jump. Uh, Metro Exodus, on the old BIOS, 46.2 frames per second. Jumps to 50.6. Doesn't seem that significant, but we're talking about... Dude, dude, that's like 12% with just a BIOS chain. Yeah. That's screw you 2060 and hello 2060 super. Yeah. Right. So, and that's, that's the next story, is that Day one BIOS updates to give you this 10, 12% performance boost are available from all the partners. I think it was just Gigabyte that didn't have their links up yet. Uh, a couple of different websites have been compiling links to all these different uh, BIOS updates. No PC Games N is the one I linked in the article, but uh, as Rock, Power Color, Sapphire, XFX all had download links available that morning. And everybody's going to have firmware available to give you these higher clocks and higher memory clocks, uh, higher memory speed. So it's just kind of funny. I, I felt like this completely overshadowed the launch that it became a launch about a BIOS update instead of a launch about a new GPU because the GPU itself, and I was getting, I mean, as I was taking notes and writing stuff down and preparing for the review and going over the specs and stuff, and I had got the card in and started some initial testing. This was going to be a really underwhelming review. It was not going to be a good review for AMD. It's like this card, I think it's like I was saying before, like I think they're charging as much as they think they can get away with, blah, blah, blah. Dramatic performance improvements from this update have completely changed my opinion of this. Now suddenly, hey, this is a great value because you're not going to be able to find one of those RTX 2060 cards at 299 unless you're like... uh able to pre-order it on Amazon or something or get it straight from EVGA when you're notified when it comes back in stock because I think it's been out of stock at least at that price and you can get them I think around to 309 is where they're really available but if you compare that to a card like the one we tested which is 289 then you know you're saving 20 bucks if you don't care about ray tracing that's going to be the big difference still because that's the RTX series that we're comparing this to. So it has the hardware ray tracing support built in. Although 2060 is really, it's only like DLSS ray tracing from a, pra- like practically speaking, you wouldn't run to run high resolution real time ray tracing on that and, and get really acceptable frame rates. So I don't know, like did we obviously, we obviously talked about this already, but just to kind of recap the BIOS update thing, I haven't really asked you either of you. How do you feel about this? Like, do you think it's? I, I, don't, I actually saw a headline that or somebody was saying something like bait and switch, which I find kind of funny. It would be as if you had bought it at the higher specs and then a firmware update came down and lowered the specs. I don't think it's you ever a, a new problem. BIOS card, it costs you thirty dollars, and we'll ship it to you. Yeah, they're not charging yeah, no, for this update. Yeah. It just if requires done some... that, you'd, you'd be pissed. Yeah. Yeah. But as it is, uh, if you've got a little bit of knowledge about flashing stuff and how, uh, you know, their tool is pretty easy. Yeah. It's a free. Just about every card yeah. ships with at least two BIOS anyway. So if you screw it up, you can reflash it back. That's the nice thing. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I, we just had the one sample. So I, as soon as this, I got this email, I got it on the 15th. And I'm like, oh, of course, of course, something changes. Usually, honestly, with AMD, it's a very late driver update. This has happened, I think, twice in the last year or so, where they're right before the launch. Like, I think it was a day before a day before the 5700 series launch. We have a new driver. Like, too late. I'm already done testing. I'm writing it up. So I'm not going to go retest two cards 
through like six games at two resolutions, three times each, because you we finally gave you twelve hours, Sebastian. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was more like sixteen hours, but I wasn't about to okay. do that. I stayed up all night <laughs> to get the thing done anyway, and I was not about to literally kill myself because of a driver update. So this time no driver updates. We had the same driver I think starting from like the 13th or something. I never updated that. But I don't know. I it's their tool, the picture in the little news post about this day one update is an actual screenshot I took of updating my card, our card, and the tool is easy to use. The card. Right the Windows. Yeah. You don't have to put it on like a free DOS boot stick or anything like that. You can actually just run it right from windows. Oh, thank Your the Lord. Because hangs. that was, that was a pain in the ass to do yeah. back in the day, yes. which was what three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. The last, last time yeah. I did a V BIOS update, it was like booting into a command prompt and having to type in the, the, the actual full name of the ROM mm-hmm. file and hoping for the best, hoping it would actually display something when the system restarted. And here it's just, you know, it programs it, it erases blocks, and it's just like any Windows-based firmware update. I think if you're on Linux, you probably still have to do um, like a boot, like a FreeDOS flash drive with this. You know, it, it, both it, seems, it seems like the gamesmanship in between them all are, you know, it, it's increasing by the year. I mean, we, it's been a while since the 2000 series were released for NVIDIA, and the the Super Series was, was there to kind of uh cut cut amd off at the pass and it seems yeah. like this one was it's like you know we're gonna you know they, they it wasn't debated but it was like you we're gonna set your expectations low and then right before it launches we're gonna have the actual real release bios and that has totally changed pretty much every reviewer's response to this product from being a eh, mediocre to hey this is really great and yeah. so I think that AMD kind of did a little psychology here to to get some uh, you know much much more positive coverage of what is essentially kind of just a mid range part that is detuned from their other higher mid range part. And I, for a nice change, you- instead of cutting the price at the last second, which has been traditional for a year and a half, two years now, uh, the Gave you more performance. So that's actually a fresh change. So I kind of like that, but there should have been more lead time. Yeah. But I, then again, with people have, having an extension span of 30 seconds, you almost need to do that for video reviewers where they've already forgotten about it. True. Because then the, there was excited chatter. I, that's true. I didn't think about that because the, the YouTube side of things, this would have been, hey, an AMD sent out this, this update and it makes the card 10% faster, which sounds really good. I just, I have mixed feelings because I feel like it it doesn't seem as, it seems like these launches are less polished. Like like they're, they almost seem a bit desperate and it's cat and mouse between them and NVIDIA. NVIDIA just seems to have the upper hand and so NVIDIA has to, or AMD has to resort to trickery. Just, just, like, just wait until a third party enters the fray. I know and it has billions and billions of dollars at their back. Yeah, but are they willing? The games have only just begun. <sighs> I, so I've I got to admit like, that, he... <laughs> that. Okay, I'll, just I'll saying... finish mine and can go on to yours. That Intel is a little bit slower moving in these kind of launches. Well, when you get that big, yeah, you tend to move slower. It's a lot more layers that you got to pass stuff through to get it approved. While AMD is still pretty hungry and lean, heavy on the lean part. Mm-hmm. What were you about to say, Sebastian? Oh, on, the, on the yeah, on the graphic side, yeah. Maybe this is just their sort of. It's like guerrilla warfare on the ATI side of things, where. Well, you know what hey, you know uh, what let's, Henry. Kissinger let's announce it at one price about. and lower it, and we'll announce it with one set of specs and then change them and. Doesn't like maybe it's they're like a startup. They're acting like a startup, maybe. Yeah. Just, well, you, you know what Henry Kissinger said about guerrilla warfare. What? As long as the guerrilla does not win, lose, the guerrilla wins. Sorry, it's a terrible okay. Henry Kissinger thing, but words, I've heard worse. Words to live by. Yeah. As long as the guerrilla does not lose, the guerrilla wins. 
Now let's talk Big Navi. Big Navi. Big Navi. Yeah. Whenever that might it, be here. We'll be talking uh, about it for a now. lot soon. Yeah. For now, well, we won't let's take a break. It, but we'll talk about it. Let's take a break and hear from one of our sponsors for this week. The new year is about growth and change. And if you're a business owner looking to grow your business, LinkedIn can help you find the right hires that can set you up for a strong year. And that's because it's not just about finding an employee, it's about finding the right employee. Hiring the right or wrong person can make or break your business. And LinkedIn Jobs helps you screen candidates with the hard and soft skills you're looking for so you can find that right person fast. Things like collaboration, creativity, adaptability. LinkedIn looks beyond the traditional work skills and puts your job post in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. And that's because LinkedIn Jobs can tie into the existing LinkedIn business network. Because the truth is, there is that right person out there for you, the right person to fill that role, to take your company to the next level. But that person may not be looking for a job in your field. They may not be looking for a job at all. And so with LinkedIn, identifying the right skills, the right talents, the right opportunities, they can put your job post in front of people who may not have even realized that a better opportunity was there. It's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn, and it's why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash pcper. Again, that's linkedin.com slash pcper to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And thank you, uh, Jim, for that. And thank you to LinkedIn Jobs. And let's move to, uh, Jeremy, you wrote this up for us, the Intel Nook, more Nook news. Something about Everyone Tiger Lake. Nook. Yeah, but Tiger Lake, now to refresh my memory, Tiger Lake, is is it 10 nanometers at 10 plus? This is the new stuff, right? The, this ice 10 plus, 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 plus. Okay. Wait, that might have been one too many pluses. I can't. Yeah. Remember. Well, I'm thinking you're, you're thinking of 14, but yes, I like where your head's at. It's 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 a enhancement. It's something that's better. I assume. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's going to be interesting. This will be our first uh, sort of look at a nice small system that's going to be using the new Intel Z graphics, or G if you prefer. And although it'd be interesting to see if those was a typo or not, they are seriously talking PCIe 4 Gen 4 NVMe support. So this would be the first that we see of that, which would be very nice. Comes in two different styles. One is the one you're looking at there, the usual sort of knock that looks like a it could be VESA mounted to the back of a monitor because, well, it could be. Uh, and so that Panther Canyon comes from Tiger Lake U, U, i3s through i7s uh, with just the onboard graphics as your choice because it's so tiny. And, you know, a, a decent amount, including front, front and rear Thunderbolt 3 ports, uh, not to mention 2,500 megabits Ethernet. So really good for kind of point of sales and charge through USB-C if you like. The more interesting one looks sort of like a logo we've seen before. Uh, Skull Trail was a little while ago. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it, it's come back. And so this one, the extreme is going to be a little more interesting. You're only going to be able to get I5 or I7s, no I3s, which makes sense. And they don't say what GPU it is because this was just off of a couple of slides that Fanless Tech saw. But it's going to have either six or eight gigs of RAM. So you're looking at, you know, a full, decent GPU. Um, would be utterly and completely shocked if this is the first time we see an Intel uh, discrete GPU. So yeah. we'll see who ends up in there. But it's but a do you really think thing. it would be Vega again? Because they this they discontinued that. It looks the same, but an unspecified GPU would they put Nvidia in this thing? Like they they're going to be so close to their own discrete graphics product. What if this is? What if this is their launch of the new graphics card like the, the first it's an odd with, way to launch it discreet. yeah but not impossible i just can't Gosh, see them muted. putting can't see them putting vega in it 
And I certainly don't see them putting Navi in it. What's the timing no. of this again? Uh, so Tiger Lake U is earlier this early this year. Yeah, second half of like 2020. Two? Yeah, oh, no, second half. C's not going to be production ready for a while. I mean, they have those test cards out for developers, and it's not, it's not production ready. Silicon, not and competitive. To be perfectly f- uh, accurate, they do say it's a to be determined third party. Oh, okay. Graphics. Okay. Yeah. So, so and now Matrix. that I'm reading it, just to double check. Yes. It'll be. A they party still are active. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, S3 finally folded, but you know. <sighs> They had that little tiny slice of percentage overseas for the longest time. Yeah. Interesting. So, and of course, it will support Optane. Thus, tripling what, the price of the yeah. Nook you're buying. <laughs> Can you please enlighten me about what a steampunk uh, power supply is, Jeremy? Uh, it's an incredibly awful name that's trying to, you know, be fresh and you know, catch up with a. It's what, you know, like this, a decade what, old? Two years ago, this was a really big thing ending. Okay. And it's from First Power. Have you ever heard of them before? I have not. Is it First Power or First Player? I would assume Power, right? Or sorry, First Player. Oh. First Power would have made a lot more sense to be perfectly yeah. honest. First Player. Interesting. Yeah. And so they're, they're the actual, guys... oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the OEM. This is not coming from uh, one of our, you know, one of the two usual suspects that are actually doing the uh, insides of your power supply. The guys did this straight through. Now, the, the problem with this is that, I mean, not only is the name a little bit weird and, you know, the, the branding is a bit strange, but they went to the complete opposite of channel well or Seasonic and went with like Cheng X capacitors, uh, a really ancient sleeve bearing Yen Loon or Yet Loon fan. Oh, nice. Like, almost every single possible way you could chisel a couple of bucks off of it. They did. But, and but did it, did overall, it performed okay. It surprisingly solid PSU. So I looked at that and I'm like, yeah, this is a recipe for a disaster, you know, starting with the steampunk because that's what you want inside of your machine is steam. Seems brilliant, right? But when, you know, Tech Power Up got through with it, they kind of mentioned that uh, from off to getting your full 12 volt took a little bit wire, longer than normal. Uh, the overvolt protections, uh, There were some sensitive triggering points, which is not necessarily a bad thing because all it does is shut the PSU down. It doesn't kill it. And one of the nice things is that some of that, some of the OCP and OPP features are actually built into the hardware as opposed to being a secondary chip added on, like you will see in some of the others. So it's an interesting mix. It's got a seven year warranty. So even if things go horribly, horribly wrong, it seems like they managed to figure out a way to cut down a lot of the price of their components without sacrificing too much in the way of the performance. So 750 watt for 90 bucks. Another issue because at a hundred, you can pretty much take your pick of anything you want. Yeah, that's so still, it, I, I have seen PSUs creep up. I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but PSUs have gotten a lot more expensive. I know everybody talks about the price of memory. And storage, but there was a time just a few years ago, and it seemed like you could just take your pick of any 80 plus gold rated fully modular power supply, fair, fairly high wattage, and it wasn't expensive at all. Like I was looking at start like beginner, like acceptable power supplies, like the cheaper stuff from EVGA that was like 30 bucks on Amazon. And I was building people's systems or recommending, you know, for a system build. I just grabbed one of these like 30, 35 dollar PSU, or you know, they're fine. And then I watched those go up to like $50, $55, now getting anything 80 plus certified at all. And they have the new 80 plus, I think it's white. It's a lower level certification below silver. Uh, that is now around $45, $50. Yeah. And then it moves up to gold, which is more expensive than it ever was that I can remember. 
So to see seven year warranty, ninety dollars for seven hundred fifty watts, eighty plus gold, fully modular, it's it's definitely a good value. It's just like you said, it seems like they're just kind of recycling an older power power supply, mm-hmm. or at least building one up using some older components. But hey, or you know, you know stuff that was significantly cheaper because they were buying it off yeah. of a table in bulk. But surprisingly I, effective for what it's called yeah. and what it was built out of. And by the way, I have to hand it to Tech Power Up. For, I've never seen uh, PSU photography like this. Yeah, there they do just, like stripping them down. Like, and we, we're used to that. Lee takes pictures of the insides and stuff, but there's like one, two, three, four, eight, 12, 16, 12. We're like two dozen photos of the internals and like ultra close up macro shots of different mm-hmm. components on the surface of the board. So if you know any of this stuff, you can basically you you can find out every single surface mounted component on this thing. Just look at these photos. Uh you know, talk I, about I soldering back, quality. <laughs> back in the late 90s, <clears throat> I was sent a power supply to review. I started mm-hmm. doing as many tests as I possibly could without like an oscilloscope or anything. And it's like I am totally unprepared to do anything reasonable with this. I yeah, have, I'm a fairly uh, technical individual. Fairly. This is another level, though. This is all like... It, it yeah. honest to God, yeah. is. It just, you know, what Lee does, what these guys do. It's, you know, here, I'm going to measure the... the the wattage at the uh, plug and I'm going to go into the motherboard and I'm going to look at how things fluctuate under there under circumstances that I can't really control. And what I'm am I going to talk about a dirty power to see what happens? And, yeah, no, and it's just like am. I plugged it in. The shit just works. That's, that's <laughs> the extent of what I could do for review. No flames, no shock. Computer turned on. Yeah. It did. No the magic smoke was works. released. Shit just works, man. Shit just works award. It is our best award. We've not really given it out. Yeah, Yeah. it's a little known award level. I was going to say Passmark, the company that does CPU benchmarks you've probably heard of. They have an inline PSU tester now. And I think it was Tech Power Up. Somebody released a review of it in the last few days. Oh, Uh, yeah, I like that. I... I have one of these things. And for some reason I thought, oh, I'll handle this. This will be easy because it has software and it plugs into the system with USB and you can monitor the PSU and it's a pass-through system. So you just have it going in between the power supply and the motherboard and you get diagnostics. Well, um, it's one thing to hook it up. It's another thing to interpret the data that you're looking at. And then I realized after I'm running like extended testing with this thing, like, yeah, I have these numbers now from extended testing, but versus what? Versus the same power supply with all of the equipment I don't have to test it. So at this point. Dude, how come I didn't have that in 1999? Right. It's it's a really cool device. PC power and cooling would have sold it to you for 500 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, but they had all had solid caps and a really loud freaking fan. Oh, I miss them. Mm. I, I had a PC power and cooling power supply. That was very good. It was the first all modular one that I ever had. I was so proud of it. Uh, okay, let's move on from power supply talk. Hewlett Packard Enterprise. The, okay, this is this is the Intel drought stuff. So, yeah. Jeremy, I, I I think it was um, Charlie, that's semi accurate, who had predicted this a while back that they were going to continue mm-hmm. to have shortages and issues on the. Um, Enterprise side of things, the Xeon processors in 2020, and apparently that is the case. Well, not only that, but I mean, anecdotally, back in January of 2019, my boss went to a Dell server type get together in Oklahoma City. And uh, someone brought up, it's like, uh, you know, the lead times on these Xeons are pretty high. Why, Why is that? And the Dell guy's like, have you thought about AMD Epic? And it's kind of interesting that even back then, they knew that this stuff was coming down the line. And even the the first generation Epic stuff was good, 
not great. Not like the Zen two based things that we, we have now, but yeah, I, I think that we saw a lot of this coming down the road, especially with how much they've uh, differentiated Zeons. You've got the, you know, silver gold platinum, and I don't even know if they do that crap anymore. And, and yeah, they just are unable to, and I'm sorry if I've gotten off of track, but no, this has been known that Intel has had issues with delivering these big products for a while and they continue to because they're still on 14 nanometer plus 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 whatever but go ahead so you you source this from the register right jeremy that yeah it's hp enterprise who's saying this this is not coming from intel Uh, the other reports that are out there are not like official statements from intel they're not coming out and saying hey we're having shortages we're gonna have problems delivering in 2020 this is tradition they they have no official comment as an official comment Hmm. but it's looking at a couple of different things one of which is exactly what josh has said is like when a Dell or an HP rep is saying, have you considered AMD? You start smelling for burnt toast because this is not the world we're in anymore and hasn't been for well over a decade that one of them would even mention AMD uh, and as apart from disparaging them as to why it is you're paying the extra for the Intel, if you were to bother to mention that. But the at the same time, they're sort of discussing that it's not all that Intel supply is horrible or that they've hit a point where they just can't process chips because something's broken. It's they're still desperately trying to move uh, the process. So you've got to have a fair amount of resources devoted to moving down to a smaller process, maybe not hardware, but certainly engineering the money that you're paying people. And this could, you know, have a slightly negative impact on what their yields are at the moment. You also have the, the, the TikToks and the Googles and Amazons of the world growing at a stupendous pace. So even if Intel was just, you know, cranking out chips as they always would, the demand has gone up so fast in such a short time that anyone in this business is struggling to keep up with demand. It's... You know, it, it's, it's, I think, fair to mention some of that as, as exacerbating the situation. But J- Josh, Charlie, uh, most of the industry analysts and OEMs that we've talked to since 20, late 2019 has been, or early 2019 rather, have been saying, yeah, this is going to be an issue and it's not going away in a quarter or a half or a year. This, this will be with us for a while until, you know, something changes. And AMD, thankfully, is actually well positioned to be able to take advantage of this and is doing gangbusters, but is going to run into the exact same issue as Intel is much quicker than Intel because they don't have anywhere near the depth of supply, but it's It's, improving. It's going to be an interesting year. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They, they have made, they have been able to make a lot more wafer orders uh, in the past two months than they had previously uh, because just, you know, you can, you can look at the 3,900 X and the 3,950. And how that, and again, I'm going off on another segue, but <clears throat> uh, I just went blank. Well, it, yeah, Is I it mean, one of those segue days? off the cliff, it's, did you? I, I sure did. But anyway, uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. Yeah, PC market is dead, just like it has been for the past <laughs> 10, 15 years. Yep. It's dead. It's not growing. There's... There's no x86 chip, you know, panacea that we're going to see that people are going to buy and buy and buy, and there's no demand for it, and it's just going to die, and there's no reason to, you know, ever upgrade your PC, blah, 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 blah. You know, sure, the numbers go down a little bit now and then, but holy cow, this is just a growth industry, period. It. Mm-hmm. The, the, there's so much software out there, and new applications, and new thinking, and new games, and new everything that will suck up the power people want snappy laptops there's a price for that same thing on desktops all of it it's just it's a curve and we're riding it up it's a roller coaster eventually we'll reach the top i'm not sure when maybe in 2029 
but yeah, I don't know. Well, the old saying the that end. it's cheaper yeah. storage is cheaper than paying a good programmer, and now we're hitting the point where processing power is cheaper than paying a decent programmer. The even if PCs were dying, and we we've seen nothing but growth there, but I think a lot of that has to do with you know there's a new generation of people playing games, there's a new generation of people streaming, and there's just, it just makes sense to have dedicated hardware for a lot of these sort of enthusiast driven categories, and of course laptops are still by and large, what people buy when they're thinking about buying a computer. But think about the fact that even if all you use is a smartphone and you're completely off of a laptop, like I have family members who they drag out the laptop if they absolutely have to, or they don't even have uh, a machine that was built within the last decade and they do everything on a phone. They're still relying on servers for everything they do on that phone. And you think about connected devices, like say your smart doorbell and your smart thermostat and your smart lights and your smartphone, those are all connecting to servers. It's not like the enterprise side of things is going anywhere. It's just going to get more and more and more vital. If game streaming they want more density. takes off. They need yeah. more density. So, that, I mean, AMD, their position is they couldn't have written this better. If somebody no. had started writing out this story 10 years ago, it would have been like, are you kidding me? You think that all of these things are going to happen okay, to position enough, AMD? Right. Like, there's no way. There's no way that Intel. It's kind of funny to me to think that Intel, at least on desktop, had such a big lead that they've been They've, they're just completely behind at this point. Yet still reasonably competitive. Like it's it's amazing to me that like a 9700K is still a great gaming chip because they have. Yeah, but we're they talking. Have good we're enough. talking about you know 100 to one ratio of engineers at Intel versus engineers at at AMD. Yeah. Right. And yeah. unfortunately just, for Intel, they have relied on their engineering going hand in hand with manufacturing and developing yes. really good products and manufacturing has been screwing the pooch and their engineering is just sitting there. It's like, we've got all these ideas. We've got these designs. We've got technology that you have not seen, but because we bet on a certain process node to be available at a certain time, we did all of our design around that. Mm. Right. And there's only so much they can Which do with Skylake at this AMD. point. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the AMD stuff is, I mean, these are decisions made seven years ago that yeah. we're on now. And so that's yeah. that's under Rory Reed. And, uh, you know, bringing in Jim, um, elevating Raja. I mean, Raja didn't do much in the CPUs, but still, it was that 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 leadership. And at and, and least Sue was brought in. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh you know I'm I'm kind of curious if they can keep this up because it was a pretty impressive run to go from bulldozer to Zen 2. Yeah, it does aptly named. All right, let's let's take another break and hear from the second of our uh, podcast sponsors this week. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Now at this point, I hope all of you know how important a VPN is for protecting your privacy and security while browsing online. But of course, another benefit of a VPN is that it can change your location, at least as far as the websites and services you're connecting to are concerned. And this is important because there's so much content online these days that is starting to become region locked. It's only available in certain areas. For example, here in the US, we don't get all the exclusive UK content that's available on Netflix, for example. And that's where a VPN like ExpressVPN comes in because it allows you to change your location to a VPN server in that region and suddenly open up access to all of that content. ExpressVPN hides your IP address and lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. And ExpressVPN has servers all over the world. Pretty much any country you could think of, you're going to be able to find an ExpressVPN server there that's going to give you a fast connection to all that content. And not just Netflix, it's Hulu, BBC iPlayer, YouTube. It works great for all of these services. Now, of course, any VPN service can do this, but the reason I choose ExpressVPN, and I've been an ExpressVPN customer for over three years now, is because they have that great availability with all of those servers in all of those regions, and they're fast. When I first started looking at VPN services uh, about three years ago, I compared a bunch of them, 
and by far and consistently, regardless of server that I chose in region, ExpressVPN was the fastest. You're not going to be bottlenecked because that's that's the key factor with, with VPNs is it, it gives you all that security and all these features by routing your traffic through them. And that makes them the bottleneck. So it doesn't matter if you've got gigabit fiber at your house, if your VPN service is, you know, at dial-up speeds, that's what your experience is going to be. So you need your, your VPN service to be fast and ExpressVPN is the fastest that I've used. And that means, especially when considering media playback, there's no buffering, there's, there's no lag. You can stream at HD at UHD, you know, you still need a fast internet connection at your, at your source, but ExpressVPN is not going to be your bottleneck. And of course, ExpressVPN is also compatible with all of your devices, not just your, your PC or Mac. It works with your phones, your consoles, smart TVs, and more. So like I said, I've been a happy paying ExpressVPN customer for years, and we really want you to check it out. And we've got a great offer for you here. If you go to expressvpn.com slash PCPer, you can get an extra three months of service when you sign up for a 12-month plan. So that's 15 months for the price of 12. Expressvpn.com slash PC per. Support the show, watch what you want, when you want, and get all of those great protection and privacy features that a quality VPN brings you with ExpressVPN. Expressvpn.com slash PC per for three free months. All right, back to the show. All right, thank you, uh, ExpressVPN. And we have just a handful of additional stories. I can't wait to talk about this Sonos thing. But first, let's talk about something more PC gamery. Jeremy. It's post CES, but guess what? More new monitors. I feel like monitors were one of the only more interesting kind of hardware things at a CES. We saw that insane 360 hertz monitor and some other some other stuff come out of well, it. Well, sadly, the before, one you're looking before at before Jeremy starts, you know, I, I apologize for having drunk anything before there, but before Jeremy starts, can I throw in a, a couple of cents to give a prelude to to what he's going on to? Okay. Okay. So really when continue. LCD monitors finally became inexpensive enough for average people to start buying around 2004, 2005 for the low end stuff. We saw very little innovation in between 2005 and 2015. It was all IPS, VA, 60 hertz, nothing too crazy in terms of, you know, we had no G-Sync. We had no FreeSync. We had no HDR. We had no higher frame rates, uh, you know, hertz. People were advertising their on-screen controls. Like like you literally got... Got in your press was, We've got an all new on screen display. Nothing except slight price improvements. You know, and in, in, in 2005, you could get a 24, 23 inch, 60 hertz, uh, 1920 by 1200 for 1000 to 1200 bucks. And then by 2015, you can get that same thing for $200, but it was, a, it was, it was the same technology, just cheaper. And now, now, Look what we have wrought, and it's awesome. Talk about it, Jeremy. Yeah, it it is. It's it's pretty nifty. The one that you were looking at the start uh, is the, the big gaming series. So these are the Mag two seventy twos. They they're arranged in price between two eighty to three hundred fifty, depending on how much you want to pay. Uh, two of the models are just you're you're gonna run in the mill ten eighty p. One is just you know the, the Less, least expensive of them all is just a normal 27 inch 1500R curved panel at 1080p. The slightly more expensive one hits uh, 180 hertz, I believe it is, or no, 260, 240 hertz uh, on FreeSync, which, you know, cranks up the price, but it is really rather nice. And the last one is a 1440p for the people who like just a slightly bit more amount of resolution. That drops the max free sync down to 165 of which is you know pretty common for what we're seeing they've got some newer features uh something they're calling night vision 
which to, to, to be honest, uh, the way they describe it, where it makes it amplifies details in dark areas of the screen. Sounds like it, it's trying to make up for the HDR drowning out some of the other things and trying to do an interesting balance. So we'll see how night vision works out fairly well. And if, you know, it is this sort of one of the things an HDR screen needs to be able to play, say a JJ Abrams movie without blinding you for about three to four hours. Then there were the other two, which are a little more interesting. The mag one sixty ones. Would anyone be interested in a 1080p display that's five millimeters thick, weighs two pounds, and comes with a protective case that you can store it in that also acts as a stand, much like a surface? Mm. But with the normal plugs to go into a, a desktop or act as an external monitor for a, a laptop. So you don't have to worry this about it. It's not one of those. It's not one of those USB monitors then. It actually uses like HDMI or display port. Or type C. Like you can okay. do type C. They're 15.6 inches. They're IPS. Uh what? the 161 is just, you know, plain old boring. Uh the V offers 240 hertz refresh rate. So now you've got this portable mm-hmm. display with a high refresh rate. I, I'm looking at going, it's neat on the one hand, 250 bucks, you know, that's not obnoxious for a monitor. The stand looks decent enough that it, it's going to sit and it's MSI. So they've designed it fairly well. But as I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm reading through it, and I'm just, I'm not sure if this is something that's going to be popular and useful or if it's looking for a problem that doesn't actually exist. Okay, does that price include the carry case, Jeremy? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're not so this, pulling a surface here. So with the pop-out stand and the carry case, just two forty-nine. We have two five hundred and forty of these remaining in the uh, champagne, and uh, twelve hundred in the silver. Uh, just seems like something that is tailor-made for like a late-night QVC broadcast yes i like the idea of the portable monitors though i i want a really small one that just connects to whatever via hdmi or display port and i've actually looked at some of these portables before you get into the portable category and you often come into like these usb monitors that are designed to be a second display for a laptop and this is kind of interesting especially at that There's weight a little more yeah well not only that but a lot of those usb ones don't require an extra external power they just plug into the USB. Mm-hmm. Not fantastic. This is, this is USB powered. Yeah. Yeah. This is also USB now powered. If it, now, if it could get its power from the type C and video simultaneously, that would be interesting. And also would drain your they, laptop battery. The PR did not explicitly sell that, spell that out, nor could I find any hint of if that worked or not on the website, which was upsetting uh, to me technically, but, the, the website itself, if you were impulse buying as a consumer, it was gorgeous, which is probably what would sell it more so. Hey, speaking of attractive things, uh, but in this case, attractive things that are actually very crappy under the surface when you actually start to oh. Oh, dive wait, a little no, bit deeper. We're not deeper. talking about me at all. No, no, no. Oh, you're an attractive okay. person with, uh, you know, even more inner beauty. Plenty of utility. Plenty. Uh, Sonos. So if, if you're familiar with Sonos, they're this kind of lifestyle brand where it's this connected speaker experience and it solved the problem a lot of millennials had where it's how do I get music in my house slash apartment? And well, you just plug in these sort of modular internet connected speaker things and amplifier units and you can stream Spotify all over your house with this, you know, really easy to set up smart speaker system. And I think we mentioned this recently, fairly recently, because I think it was around October or November that Sonos was in the news because they were offering a discount on new speaker purchases, but you had to brick your old ones and either take them to a recycler or send them to Sonos for to be destroyed. They didn't want their speakers on the used market. 
a it's not even about devaluing the brand or anything it's simply no uh we came up with this product that's popular that people bought and kept and retention of this product is you know close to 100 percent. so we got to do something to sell new speakers and amplifiers to people what better way than to just either try to get people to brick their own device for a 30 percent off coupon or take it to the next level and just kill support for these speakers going forward. So if you bought, what is it, 2005 to 2011, that range. Well, when well this the was Connect, really taking it's, off. it's a bit of a lie because the Connect amp is only like 2017, 2018. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So even that. So if, when this happens, you won't be able to run the old, the legacy Sonos soft or uh, hardware with new hardware. You're gonna you they want you to upgrade everything, so it's it's going to become well, you, inconvenient. If you have the temerity to keep some of your older stuff and hook it into the new system you just bought, they're suggesting they'll block the updates to that new stuff too until you unplug the old stuff. That's nice. Yeah, it'll it's, recognize it's, the one device is connected. Like, oh, I'm sorry, we can't support this. So it's, it's a security a risk, I'm sure, on, at this point. Yeah. Yes. I've yeah, had a I, pair. I've had my paradigm. Okay, bought my first set of atoms with a ten-inch passive sub in 1995, and I'm still using those. I did get new mains and a different center, but my new mains are still 20 years old, mm-hmm. m- maybe more. I still use them. They sound great because I attach them to wires to a receiver. And when I upgrade my receiver, my speakers still work. Right. I have a pair of Magnapans that will work until the day that they, you know, disintegrate. And then you can still have those repaired. Like, you know, when when you'd use speakers until the foam surrounds would start to crumble. And then you could have them refoamed. So it's the fact that this is uh, an ecosystem that you're buying into that it'd be like if Apple decided that, and because of course they can cut support to iPhones, but it's not like the iPhone doesn't work anymore. It just stops getting iOS updates. And it's the same with Android phones. I have a Nexus four that I, if I wanted to, it's from around 2012, if I wanted to, I could power that up and start using it it will connect it, it, it supports modern wi-fi standards it still connects to 4g and I, yeah well 3g yeah and it it will work i i have actually used that within the last year and a half i think on t-mobile uh for so i don't even remember why but the it it would technically work just like i could build up an old computer i could grab an athlon uh 64 and put it on a motherboard and grab a spare SSD and put together a system that's woefully out of date by modern standards, but would still get online and do some basic gaming, like kind of early 2000s gaming and stuff. And it'd be fine. I'd actually be able to use it as a productivity machine if I had no other option. Or I have an old, I have old laptops that I could turn on and technically use as long as they support modern wireless standards. But uh, the fact that there's a product that it's a firmware update that prevents its use is kind of staggering to me. You had, of course, drawn the, the comparison, Jeremy, to uh, Logitech Harmony, which I'd kind of forgotten about that, that no. whole thing. Because that was... 2018, they were going to brick them, and then they realized that wasn't very well received, so they let you essentially buy the new version for about 30% MSRP, and then the very next year essentially this where yeah we're not giving you any more updates and after a while it's just not gonna work i still don't how i don't understand how this is going to sonos it seems like this is like a, a desperate attempt to drive margin like sales like maybe this was their their ceo's attempt like in 2020 we have to do something and we're gonna do this it seems like the the pr backlash from this could be really bad Maybe people just don't understand what this means. It's like, oh, it's an older Maybe product. We're not going to support it anymore. Now. Yeah, we've been programmed. Just accept this. Planned obsolescence is real. 
it would be nice to know that at the outset, though, like you're going to buy into this expensive, it's not cheap, you can buy into this expensive Sonos lifestyle where you buy their amps and their speakers and use their apps. And, oh, but it's only going to work for like five years. So it's like leasing a car. Do you want to pay that monthly payment to just lease it? Or are you okay with, you know, some people like to have a new car every two years. Some people like the lower payment of a lease, but other people like to buy and own. Just like Josh and I, and I'm sure Jeremy, you have sound equipment to listen to music that I can, I can, I can listen to digital music. Remember when music. Kenwood used to make good amps? Yeah, they were a good sort of budget one. option. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, it 19, still works, huh? Uh, I got a 1994 was, Yamaha high. Oh, good on you. Amp. You know, high, uh, not amp, but. Um, Receiver? Yeah, it's 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 well, it's sorry, one of the, you know, it's, it wasn't high wattage, but it was high amperage. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Which is something that's kind of lost these days. I remember yeah. when Harman Kardon had some of these smaller amps, like they were only like fifty yeah, watts. They were like twenty five watts, but they could power right. it through. Ooh, just yeah, How many we're talking solid you want to hook up to me. I don't care. Yeah. And that's solid state. And think about the the tube stuff. That's technically maybe only like ten watts, but can just fill a room but if you had the right speakers for it stage wise uh, <laughs> yes so okay oh yeah Current. i have a I, I had a i had a four watt vox tube amp and it was stupid that i even sold it it was one of the atvs or i can't remember what it's called av4 no anyway i had one for a while that thing i had to turn it down to a quarter watt it had an attenuator built in because four watts was crazy. If you wanted any kind of overdrive, you had to turn the thing up so it would break up, and it was too loud for my house. And then uh, even at one watt, it got loud. So I would turn it down to a quarter watt on the switch and then turn the volume all the way up so I got a little bit of breakup so for some sort of natural overdrive. And still, it's just like, this is a super high-efficiency Celestian speaker with a four-watt amp behind it, and it's too loud. So it's, it's all about the, uh, sensitivity. What, uh, Jeremy, you wrote something up that's I'm okay. Disintegration, the cure for the current dearth. God, of the Hickory talk Hickory about Hickory. an eighties child, Jeremy. Oh yeah. Jeez. <laughs> the cure disintegration. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't get the reference. All right. Sorry. Oh, Lord. It's, it's an age check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and once it came into my mind, there was no way in hell I couldn't do that. You remember well, when, so like, Battlezone was a thing, and so it's partly first-person shooter and that you're in a thing and flying around killing people, but it's also an RTS because you're on a team, except the team are all bots that you're telling what to do. So that's disintegration. You're you're in this flyy shooty device uh, that roams around freely, blowing stuff up. And those are f the four big guns that you're seeing destroy nicely things. But you've got a team of a variety of mechanized uh, infantry, normal infantry. These are not people. This, these are all computer controlled bots that you're telling what to do. So you are doing a lot of the same sort of stuff, you know, a sort of a capture the flag thing, uh, a weird retrieval mode, which sounds like you're essentially searching for a bomb so that you can then plant it somewhere that the enemy is vulnerable. And from the sounds of it, there'll be up to 12 different factions. I don't know that it'll be 12 versus 12 uh, players, six versus six. It will certainly be one versus one, if not two by two. But it's a style of game we haven't really seen very much, which is, you know, really sort of based on very mobile vehicular combat. Uh, when's the last time Interstate 76, like sort of a thing came out or, or Carmageddon that wasn't complete and utter balls. There's an open beta starting at the end of the month, uh, 31st until the first, which you can get by just visiting the website, which you link to in the post. There is currently a closed one, which as far as I know, you're still able to get at if you so desire just to sort of take a look around and see, you know, if it's worth playing or not. It just sort of struck me as something that I haven't seen in a long time. 
And it'd be interesting to see if, you know, it's still a style that's enjoyable and how well modern technology can make it. Because like, from the video you saw there, if, uh, and for audio listeners, essentially, it was demonstrating terrain destruction. You you, you completely blew the way a, a building that you're the enemy was hiding in. That was not something we had so much back in the day. So it, it'd be interesting. And also I'd like to mention, uh, because we mentioned it again last week, and well, uh, it, it's gone past koalas burning, that the platypus might become extinct soon. If you can, uh, the Humble Australia Fire Relief Bundle we've linked to, and, and all the money goes to them. It's not uh, linked with our affiliate code or anything. That The Europa one is, but the Australia Fire Relief, if you follow that link, it's a bunch of interesting games. And, you know, every single penny of this one, is going to the Australia Fire Relief Fund. And a lot of them could use it. So take a look for 20 bucks. You can do a little bit of help and get a whole bunch of new games to add to your library of games you're going to play one of these days. One of these days. Yeah. Yeah. It's a list. Hey, the backlog could always use a few more games. Because, you know, it's not going to move anyway. And it's for all the games. Of all the games you own digitally. what do you actually play on a regular basis? Uh, one of like three titles, maybe. Yeah, but, I like play you know, World, World of Warships, boring. and I'm starting to get yeah. tired of that. Now I need to just do something else, and I've got so many games to play. No, the starting last game like I played. Game. The last game I played. I actually played a game recently just to kill an hour, and it was Warcraft Two. Uh, mm. Battle.net edition from GOG. Mm. It was that is this, you can play it on anything now. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's my idea of uh, a relaxing hour of gaming. Nothing, yep, yep, no wait. AAA titles, nothing with even GPU okay. acceleration. Just, yeah. Well, I mean, I got what Red Dead Redemption 2 and I've put hours into it, but I also haven't picked it up since like before Christmas. Uh, the one that I spend the most is on Sundays. I hook up with my dad uh, and not my brother so much that he's a young father anymore, but we, we play a, a mod for Civ 4. So I really give that GTX 1080 a workout on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's it for our topics. Let's get into picks of the week. And uh, Josh, you actually found one. Oh, during the yeah. show. I see but, it's you know, hopefully here. I didn't already uh, do this one. My mind is is turning into mush. So. I don't recognize and this. So anyway, this model. is uh, probably one of the less expensive X570 boards, but it has really good componentry. And especially the power delivery. It's a 12 plus 2 mm. phase unit. Uh, good cooling. All around, uh, decent audio. Uh, it doesn't have anything crazy for, uh, you know, uh, LAN. It's just an Intel gigabit, which is still better, I guess, than, than Realtek. It's not the 2.5G stuff that others have. But, you know, when you're looking at board construction and power delivery and the things that you will use every day, this has a lot of it. And it delivers it under 200 bucks now it's on sale for like 179 which is this would be my basic board if i were to get a new system today uh because it it just it 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 hits all the check marks of what you really need for a solid well-performing board and unlike their video cards i like gigabyte motherboards their video cards can go suck raw eggs because I've had more problems with them running and trying to RMA them than any other thing that I've done before. But their motherboards have been very, very solid. And so this is one that I'm kind of looking at my for, for myself if I want to upgrade my uh, main machine to like a 3600X then this is this is the primary product that uh, that that really hits all of the check marks for me and it's not a horrible price no 179 right now on new egg that is cheap that's 20 dollars off it was cheap before at 199 for x570 especially i'm looking through the specs it's got intel wi-fi 6 built in so it's mm-hmm. 802 no that's that's, that's the non-wi-fi version 
Oh, this is the non-Wi-Fi. Why? Okay. So within yeah. the listing here on Newegg, they have the specs for the next board up. That's nice. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, why not but spend an extra one... couple of bucks for Wi-Fi on your yeah. desktop? Exactly. But hey, I mean, yeah, that's what you're really not getting with this is fancy RGB. It's extremely subtle. There's a you, little bit of lighting on the left side of the board, RGB. and that's it. Yeah. yeah. And you've got RGB control, which you can plug in other LED lighting for. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, it's just, it's everything you basically need to get up and running and even overclock or get the best performance out of without, you know, really, because it's, it's a really solid power delivery system for your Ryzen Mm. five and seven processors. Excellent. Jeremy, what is uh, your pick this week? Well, it's something that I keep thinking about, which is I should move my damn computer station from out of the middle of the apartment now that I live alone and have an entire back room I use for storage. But one of the things, because it's got low pile carpeting in it, is that there's no way in hell I'm going to drive around a chair on there without a, a plastic mat. And if you ever go looking for plastic mats, they start at 100 bucks and go up from there. Well, New Egg's having a special today. <laughs> for 30 bucks, you can get a, more or less a three by four uh, vinyl chair mat. So, you know what? I bought one because why in the hell not? Hey, At it's not just price, today. Apparently, there's five more days of this. So, even yes. after, if you're listening to this in the future, you have until uh, the 26th to purchase this for, you know, $120 off. There might be one, an equivalent in uh, the U.S., but this is a Canadian-only deal uh, with a beautiful description because it, they say it's made with high-gauge steel, so I'm, I'm curious to see how that works. I, <laughs> I have a feeling they meant high-gauge, you know, <laughs> vinyl. Uh, but, I mean, you know, so now it's going to arrive in my package, and I'm going to bring it home, and I'm going to prop it in the back room and be one step closer to one day moving my system over. We'll have to check in and see if it actually was metal. You'll get it. You're like, oh, wow, this is actually a, just a sheet of metal they have sent me. Oh, well, that's you even know, better. That, that's not a bad box. idea to do a, 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 a bunch of, of steel threads in a cross pattern mm-hmm. and then embed mm-hmm. it in vinyl. That would be awesome because that would solve a lot of my problems. It's like if, if it was like reinforced like concrete. Yeah. yeah, it would work. It's like carbon fiber without the carbon fiber. Yeah, and the price tag. It's like, yes, <laughs> it's the you only problem with the weight. What <laughs> really? <laughs> well, hear me out. Uh, I was worried about the load on my floor, so I went with a mm. ultra lightweight carbon fiber chair mat to roll my chair around on top of. Yeah, carbon fiber would probably not uh, wear particularly well in that application. No. Although I will say. A life-changing decision I made, I think about a year ago or so, getting the rollerblade-style wheels for my office chair. That's amazing. Because those roll around on anything. They're bigger yeah. wheels, so I just I don't I mean, use them. they got really good bearings in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like the ABAC 5s or 7s or whatever. Yeah. In them. Uh, my pick is yeah, not hardware. Oh, uh, what am I missing here? Uh, my pick is just an audiobook uh, on Audible. I don't know if you're familiar with the show Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist. It was on Comedy Central way back in the day. I think it started yes, in the mid Yes, I do remember Dr. Katz. And what's cool about Dr. Katz is, and this it sounds like a, a weird premise for a show. It was an animated show, but it was retro scripted, which means it was basically improvised. And then somebody had the task of cutting up all the audio and making some sort of a story out of it. And then it was animated. But what it essentially is, is uh, Jonathan Katz long has been in the industry for a long time, a stand up comedian, like way back in the day, you would have seen him on like the tonight show or something. And he knows a lot of people. So he had all these guests on his show who were stand up comedians. You've probably heard of and uh, kind of runs the gamut. And uh, the show was on for like six years. So they brought it back here and there uh, in this short form. And I know on audible, you can get some of these like little 15 minute sessions, but there is an actual like six or seven hour long 
product now called Dr. Cat's The Audiobook, which is brand new. It was done in 2018. And it's just like the show. And the show was essentially an audio show anyway. There was this uh, very low-grade animation for it that they called oh, Squiggle. Oh, the, the nauseating wobble of every single line yes. on that? I mean, yes. I missed that. So I, I typically would just listen to it anyway because you're just listening to stand-up. Like they would have somebody on the show who would literally, they would just be doing their own stand-up material. Like Dave Attell came on and it was just doing like Dave Attell's 1996 stand-up material. Uh, Ray Romano was on the show a few times. Dom Herrera, uh, a bunch of other people, David Cross. So a lot of them are back for this and it's new material. And some of it's just improvised again. Some of it you might recognize as stand-up, but... If you're into stand-up comedy at all, or you recognize some of the names that are on this, it's worth a listen. So, Dr. Katz, the audiobook. And especially if you're a fan of the show. I, I'm a big fan of the show. I have the complete Dr. Katz DVD box set. And I've heard that to death over the last 15 years or so since I discovered it. So, anyhow, with that, uh, you guys have anything else? Anything else for the group? Lock your office updates because uh, as of the new version 2002, Microsoft is going to automatically install a Chrome insect extension to make your default search engine thing. Bing. Bing. That's nice. Bing. And I quote, providing the benefits of Microsoft search in the browser to those end users. Okay. Right, another thing that's making is not invasive popular? enough. Okay, so the last four months, we've had multiple updates to Access that has broken Access ODBC. All these shit. Yes. All these shit. It's, it's like, come on, do you guys not do any quality control on these updates? Because what, you nobody are uses Access seriously. anymore. Uh, there's, there's still a lot. <laughs> I know there is. Josh, it's just, don't you understand just, that you are quality control? Just send report to Microsoft. Just send those tickets along. You are the beta tester. You make me sad because yeah. it takes many, many hours out of my day. <laughs> yeah, I and updated something and now nothing works. All of my R sessions are broken. Yeah. I love you can too that, use uh, some of the older versions. They actually are more robust with R anyways. I think like three Isn't five that one. The same or so. with all Microsoft products using the slightly older version that's been patched, that is battle tested, that actually works. Leaving living on the bleeding edge. Anytime an update comes down, I fear it because I, I think it's going to break stuff, or it's going to change. We're on the quarterly channel, and guess things. what? We're still getting destroyed. I'm hoping soon like to close up my ticket from last April with them. <laughs> still open it'll oh, yeah. never be closed it'll it'll be closed due to inactivity but they won't well, they, they actually before. tried that but we'd escalated it so i got a refund and got to make a new one. Oh, that's nice that was this you. reminds me i think it was today or yesterday i saw that uh microsoft has put ads for office into wordpad now so if you are somebody who still has clung to the functionality of wordpad and you're clean windows 10 install environment then you just see a little banner ad for office uh, 365 up there now fun you know what just make windows free already windows should be free it should be something that's as easy to get as an aol cd back in the late 1990s just everybody has it everywhere windows 10 get it now people don't mail it ask to for you. a product key anymore i mean you can install it without a product key but you still get nagged to activate it and stuff. Just though no, everybody gets it for free. Then it makes sense to have those games that auto download on a new install, even in a professional version of the yeah, operating yeah. system. It, it makes sense to have bloatware and ads. Sweet. Not when the cheapest legitimate license from Microsoft directly is $139 and you yeah. still put ads in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how easy is it to learn uh, new features in Windows? Please answer our quick survey. I'm glad you vented. Shall we move on? Yeah, well, because we're tired. done. I okay, think that's go to bed. the end, my friend. Yeah, uh, thanks for watching or listening, and uh, we will do this again next week.